Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing great on this wonderful Thursday morning. It's raining outside. We need the rain for our crops to have things to grow. And this morning on the line, we have Terry Simonette, who's executive director, president executive, our chief operating officer, chief executive officer. I'm going to get it right in a minute, Terry, for NCB, Capital Impact Partners. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Vernon. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I think that was a good introduction because uh, I think all of those titles were positions that at one point in time I held held a capital impact partner. So uh, you were all right. (laughs) Okay. And by the way, it's Simonette, not Simonette. Simonette. uh, And I know we've only known each other for 15 or 20 years. Hey, Terry, how are you doing? Two billion dollars have gone through the partnership uh, capital impact. How have you done this, and how old is the organization first? So the organization actually was created through the same act of Congress back in 1978 that created the National Cooperative Bank, and both organizations started up. And at that time, both organizations have obviously changed significantly over the years as the environment has changed. But Capital Impact Partners, which, by the way, uh, started out uh, as a not-for-profit District of Columbia Incorporated not-for-profit in 1984 and had the name of Consumer Cooperative Development Corporation. And it was explicitly created in that act of Congress to focus resources on the uh, on the issues and the needs of low-income communities across the country, and uh, looking to promote, use, and develop the cooperative form of ownership to create solutions that would enable uh, low-income communities and Americans to have more choices, more choices in where they shop, where they go to school, how they get their health care, where they work, et cetera. And I understand that you have put two billion, that's a B dollars in these communities over these years. So it's it's interesting, Vern. Yeah, it's, we reached two billion dollars in total loan originations this year. Interestingly, a billion of that two billion dollars we originated over the last five years. So it's been fairly um strong growth over the last five years. And I think um, it's a testament to a number of things, but you know, let me focus primarily on the fact that there's such substantial need out there in underserved communities, and there's such significant opportunity to meet those needs. The organization started out making very small loans, and as a matter of fact, you know, I think you would probably characterize our lending as gap lending high-risk lending, uh, trying to create opportunities for other sources of capital to follow us. And over the the years, again, as we evolved and the organization and the environment evolved, we we started doing um, larger loans in in a variety of areas. You know, they tend to be those sectors or systems in the economy that provide everyday goods and services to to Americans, from, again, school to health care to education to shopping. But I, I also just want to want to point out that when this organization was first created, again, created through the same act of Congress that created the National Cooperative Bank, we operated very, very closely with the National Cooperative Bank for many years and continue to be partners with them in many programs. But originally, we were an affiliate of the National Cooperative Bank, 
And in that affiliate relationship, we enjoyed uh, many opportunities in order for a small organization like ours to become larger and do the things that we've done today. It was very much the result of that affiliate relationship with the National Cooperative Bank. It allowed us uh, to operate off of their platform. So we didn't have to go out and rent our own building, didn't have to go out and create our own uh, infrastructure. It juxtaposed us to an organization that operated with, uh, with very strong credit standards. Today, we operate as an independent organization. We're a CDFI, a community development financial institution. We got that designation from the Department of the Treasury back in 2011, but only after changing the affiliate relationship with the National Cooperative Bank. Again, that affiliate relationship with NCB was so important to, to where we've come to today. But there are also important resources out there that are provided by the government, in this case the Department of the Treasury, <laughs> that we were never eligible to receive and then deliver to our external um, stakeholders. So we made some changes in our relationship with NCB, very much in partnership with them so that we could become a certified community development financial institution. That was a long answer. Sorry. It was, it was a very long answer, and I want to break some of it down. I want to go back and cover okay. some of it because in the first I was doing some subtraction here, and it, in 1984 you got started, and in 26 years to 2010 you did a billion dollars worth of loans. In the last five years from 2010 to, to 2015, another billion. So it took you 26 years to get up to your first billion and five years after that to get to your second billion. And from what you were telling us in 2011, you got the CDFI, and I want to break that down a little bit for our listeners of what that's all about. So I assume becoming a CDFI and becoming independent, you had availed yourself to more financing, more money to, to lend to in low-income communities. Is that kind of a good summary of what you said? I think, that's, that? I think it's a good, that's a good summary, uh, Vernon. I think up till then, frankly, our capital dependence was substantially on the National Cooperative Bank, which, by the way, was a very good thing for both of us because we were able to um, use the balance sheet of the bank to make loans to, to a number of areas that we both continue to lend, lend to today. But, um, but yes, by getting that certification in 2010, it gave us access to ongoing resources from the CDFI fund and the Department of the Treasury. And, and I would also say, and we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about this, but it enabled us to make larger loans and um, being able to take uh, advantage of things, for example, like the New Markets Tax Credit Program. Uh, we can break that down in a bit as well. But, mm -hmm. yeah, that was, uh, that was the big difference in, in 2010 and 2011. Well, one of the things that, that you said earlier, too, was you did gap financing and high risk. When we've talked about National Co-op Bank on, on this show, I've said to them to, to have a, a mission of helping co-ops grow and get started in low-income communities is to focus is that that's so much different from most banks most banks from my taking banking thought at one point i thought i wanted to be a banker was that most banks are interested in one thing and that is well they're interested in three things it comes out in one flavor and that is getting their money back getting their money back and getting their money back <laughs> and so normally they they loan money to high-risk people people that have assets people that own things so that if this loan fails, they can go grab something else. So to, to say in your mission that you want to make loans to low income com uh, communities, that's people that don't have money. And so I've had lots of dialogue in the two years. We've been on the show now, Terry, two years. We only were going to do it for one year in October, the co-op month. But we found a lot of people that are interested in the topics so how do you make loans to people with low income or with no assets? You talk about the balance sheet, so let me give a quick definition of balance sheet for people out there that may not know it. Balance sheets look at what you own, they call assets, and that equals what you owe, so it balances. You owe liabilities and you own assets. So 
they must balance out, and it's called a balance sheet. So a lot of times, people that don't have money, they have more liabilities than they have assets. People that have money or net worth, they have more assets than they have liabilities. So most banks will look for people that have assets and more assets than they have liabilities. So how do you work with people and communities that have less assets than they have liabilities? So, well, that's the uh, the magic question and the secret sauce, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. So, and let me even sharpen the point by giving you a statistic. And uh, the statistic I'm going to give you is the the uh, the charge offs that this organization has made over the years. So, a charge off is, you know, essentially you get a bad loan. Uh, eventually, you're going to have to charge it off and take a hit because of it. Um, and this organization, over the last six years, has had a charge-off of less than 1% of average principal balance outstanding. So you could compare that to some commercial banks, and uh, their stockholders would, um, would be dancing uh, the jig <laughs> if they had those kind of results. Less than uh, 1%. So, less than 1%. So here's the, here's the answer. So, first of all, you know, and I learned this, I think, early on when I came here in the 80s or even before that because I've been involved in community development since the early 70s, that there's a major difference between uh, the perception of risk associated with low-income communities, underserved communities, emerging markets. There's this assumption that there is real risk and that you just don't want to go near it. You may redline an area, you may choose not to do a certain kind of transaction because of the negative connotation or brand of that transaction. The reality is, number one, so this is the first thing, the reality Terry, Terry, is... Terry, yes. can, you, can you hold that reality? We're going to come back to the secret sauce. Sure. Uh, we have to take our first break. So for everybody out there, if you want to hear the secret, and I definitely want to hear it from Terry Simonet, uh Stay tuned. Don't touch the dial. We're going to get the traffic and the weather, a little bit of news, and we'll be right back. 1450 WOL. Information is power. That's WOL's motto, and that's why they make a great partner for this show, because the National Co-op Bank and Vernon Oaks, who's the host of his show, wants to give you information so with that information, if you put action to it, then you can have power. So right now we're talking to Terry Simonette, who's the ex- chief executive officer and president of NCB Capital Impact Partners, which they have loaned two billion B dollars in the last thirty one years, one billion in five years. And he's telling us the secret sauce. The magic question is how do you loan to low-income communities that are perceived to be highly risky. Terry, please tell us. You were getting ready to tell us the first part of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you the first part of that. I'm also going to say that uh, the good thing for the country is that Capital Impact Partners is not the, uh, the only uh, organization that uses the secret sauce. There's actually an industry that's grown up, community development financial institutions, to serve low-income communities. But the first, uh, first thing is that and I know you will have experienced this in yourself, Vernon, and the listeners will have experienced this as well, that there's a big difference between perception and reality. If you have a perception of something, it means that you have an impression, you're far away from it, you haven't done your homework, you haven't done your analysis to understand what the real issue is. So I would say the first part of the secret sauce is to understand that it's not perception. What are the real risks, number one? Number two... Listen, when you serve low-income communities, essentially you are are looking to do things where there is a gap between what people can afford to pay for and what it costs to provide it, whether that's housing or a supermarket or health care. So what you're looking to do uh, when you're capitalizing a low-income venture is to finance that gap. The, The other thing is that you've got to be disciplined. We are an organization that has had our nose to the grindstone, again, dealing with four or five basic systems that operate in any community, some dysfunctionally, some more functionally. Those are the things that we do. We don't go off and do the next venture that comes in or the next big idea. We're looking to do things that we really understand. 
So in this organization and organizations like this, you'll know that we do not do, quote, unquote, one-off ventures. The other part of it is, Vernon, and it goes back to your original point, that we're talking about communities that really don't have assets. And many times traditional bankers want to make loans to someone that actually have assets. In the event the loan goes bad, then you simply go liquidate the assets. So capital impact partners in organizations like this have really grown up to be cash flow lenders. We're really looking at what is the potential for that organization if it enters that market at that time with that product and that management, what is the likelihood that it will produce the cash flow necessary to support all of its expenses, including the expenses associated with creating its product, the expenses associated with maintaining its facility, and finally, the, the, uh, the cash flow necessary to pay us. So we're very focused on the potential of ventures to succeed, and that takes you then back to one of my earlier points. So how do you know if a venture is going to succeed or not? And again, it's focus. You're focusing on these things that you've done many times before, so you shouldn't be surprised too often. Well, I had said on the program once I was talking to someone, I can't remember who, I said that you all look at people in the eye and you and you make your loans based on the people that you're dealing with, that whether or not they can do the job, whether or not they have integrity, that they will, that they that they can do the job and they will do the job and they will pay you back that you, that you end up making your loans on the character of the people, as opposed to the assets that the people have. Does that make any sense or it makes complete sense. And I think, and I will even add to that by saying, you know, most of the people that we're dealing with in this business are people that we might characterize as public entrepreneurs who have created and built nonprofit or cooperatively owned uh, enterprises. And, you know, I think we saw a distinct shift in this country with the disintermediation of financial markets in the 80s and 90s, where all of a sudden the banks were not there, they were in the suburbs, communities were being redlined. There was a philosophical, philosophical and I think political shift in this country to reduce the government's role in the delivery of services. And these public entrepreneurs, I mean, they're even more different. They're different than a typical entrepreneur because you can look a public entrepreneur in the eye and know that this is not a person that's simply there for their own financial benefit. They are there because they have a perspective on wanting to make a contribution to improve the way that people live. So I think you're absolutely right. It really comes down to, to character and my experience being here. I've been with Capital Impact Partners since the beginning in 31 years. Hmm. Uh, my experience is that you are dealing with people who care as deeply as you do. Now, they may not have the best idea in the world or they may not be able to execute, but character is usually not an issue for people uh, in co-ops, in community-based organizations. And your mission is to help people in communities reach their highest potential at every stage of life. I like this. I like your mission a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Vernon. It's, uh, you know, there's two key words there, and, and one is potential. Potential means having choices, doesn't it? Yes. So it means, for example, if you live in a low-income community and you are a parent, and like any parent, you want the best for your children, uh, that includes school. Oftentimes, um, you don't necessarily have an option, do you? And so, for example, one of the things that we've gotten involved in for probably the last 20 years is to finance charter schools. Charter schools are public schools, but obviously with a charter that allows for some flexibility. And there are many charter schools that have chosen to concentrate in low-income communities and to bring that choice to enable potential um, number one. The second key word or the second phrase, uh, key component of that uh, phrase is every stage of life. We, we really are an organization, a community development financial institution that has tried to focus on the very beginnings of, of life and to provide choices and opportunities, for example, in school. And then we're um, heavily focused on the other end of the life, the, uh, the end of the life that I'm closer to than uh, the beginning, that's for sure. We, 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 we both we. are. Okay, good. <laughs> we. 
So, um, and I think as you know that this organization has dedicated uh, a substantial amount of its focus to to the elderly population in this country. And in that respect, we're kind of different from most community development financial institutions because you don't find them concentrating uh, there. And we've um, you probably been involved in providing services to low income community, low income communities, and elders for the last 20 years. Uh, did something years ago called the Coming Home Program. More recently, something called the Greenhouse Program, which is an innovation in skilled nursing facilities. And most recently, and this is really exciting, Vernon. Most recently, we joined with the AARP Foundation, AARP, and the Calvert Foundation to create something called Age Strong. And Age Strong is a new $70 million fund where we will focus on creating and financing opportunities for people 50 and over in this country and focusing on four areas. And these will resonate with, I think, all of your listeners, including the, uh, the more elderly listeners, and that is housing, health care, income, and isolation. These are some of the key issues that the elders of this country and policymakers need to concentrate on. And with that age strong fund, again, a $70 million fund, we intend to provide support to organizations that are going to go out there and help us age strong. You know, Terry, this is extremely exciting. I just turned uh, 68 last month. So, oh, boy. Well, I'm only a few months behind you. Okay. <laughs> And for me, right now, this is the most exciting stage of my life. I mean, you're em- empty nester and get to play with grandchildren, and I've got my life so situated that I can live off of my Social Security. So I, yeah. I don't have a lot of debt. I don't have all of this stuff. So with right now, it's like, what do you want to do every day when you get up? What yeah. what, is, what choices, how can I help, and that's my goal, is, reason I like your goal, my goal is very similar to yours. It helps everybody that I meet, everybody across my path, I can do something to help them have a better quality of life. And it might be just how you do and, and hope and, and give them some kind of pat on the back for whatever I see. But this whole thing of health care, housing, income, and then isolation, because that's from what I've read, that's one of the biggies. And when I try to help my mother through this process, trying to find good housing, uh, as she aged and had strokes and getting the health care that she needed and, and in a situation where she's not isolated. that That's phenomenal. I, so I, I really I like what you're doing there for where I am in my life and my experience. What kind of response are you getting from your partners in this endeavor? It's incredible, Vernon. And let me just say, because you talked about um, housing, there are 19 million people that are 50 and over who are struggling to find affordable housing and living in inadequate housing. You know, just in terms of the tsunami that's hitting this country with respect to the aging of our population, the next 25 years, the number of people over 65 will double. That's from 36 million today to 72 million in 2040. Add to that uh, people over 50 and their increased longevity over the next several years will increase by 20%. Twenty percent, well, one hundred and thirty-two million dollars. So we're talking about uh, some real issues that this country has to solve, and I think the Eight Strong Fund it recognizes that we. Bernie, do you want to break? Yeah, we have to take a break. I'm so excited about what you're doing. I don't want to stop, but we'll be right back. We'll be right back. Thank you. Fourteen fifty W O L. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. With Everything Cooperative, it's the radio show that you're listening to today, and we have Terry Simonette on the line with us this morning, who is the president and chief executive officer of Capital Impact Partners. And we're talking about the difficulty and the fun, if you will, of going into low-income communities and making loans, and they've made $2 billion of loans. And he said to us that the risk uh, of going into low-income communities is perceived to be very, very high. So that most bankers that would look at going into a low-income community would not look very long because they would think with a high risk, they would need a very, very high uh, chance of getting a, a return. And so that's why sometimes the interest rates are very high if they make that loan. 
But Terry and groups of CDFIs, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, what they are, they found ways of going in, and he has only experienced his company in the last six years, 1% write-off, less than 1% write-off, and that is excellent. Uh, so that most people then pay back their loans, even low income communities perceived to be high risk communities. And so we were talking about seniors before we took break. And I didn't even want to take the break because <laughs> <laughs> what Capital Impact and their partners are doing is looking at figuring out how to have housing and health care and income and sort of solve this isolation problem for people that get to be over 65 or and you said that that's going from 36 million that we have today and in 20 years going to 72 million people in this category? That's right. The 2040, exactly. And I, and I think I and other people, and I guess the language is, is fairly dramatic and characterize it as a tsunami. But when you look at the trend line there, it is. Uh, I mean, it's really sharp. And I, I, the point I wanted to make is that with respect to this idea of trying to support the elders of this country to age strong, many of whom can't on their own. The reality is that government spending, subsidies, philanthropy can't do it all. And so the idea with the, with the Age Strong Fund was that we would actually create a movement of retail investors, people like you and me, to start investing in this critical issue and actually earning returns. So I mentioned uh, the partners, AARP Foundation, AARP Capital Impact Partners, who will essentially be originating these loans. And the other partner is the Calvert Foundation. Calvert Foundation is a, a nonprofit organization that's actually been, for the last 20 years, out there raising money through something called a community notes program. I think they've raised close to a billion dollars. And so they are a partner in the Age Strong Fund, and they will actually um, be out there working with brokers so that investors can direct their money up to the Age Strong Fund. But you can also invest as little as $20 by going to agestronginvest.org. And you can invest $20 or $21 or $30, and you can have that money working towards, again, these significant needs that um, that elders will be experiencing, helping people to uh, hopefully age in place more affordably and safely as long as possible. So we have a lot of work to do here, but I think the partnership that we've put together is significant, and uh, we're really looking forward to the number of things that Age Strong is going to be able to do okay. uh, in the way of new ventures. And, uh, Terry, we have John on the line. John, good morning. Good morning. What's your question or comment? Well, um, I, I I can't believe what I'm hearing, but uh, it sounds great. It sounds like uh, we're we're understanding uh, the uh, formula of uh, rotating money and wealth within our community or outside of our community. And uh, my my question to your guests: I'm working on the uh, D.C. reparations and restitution initiative here in Washington, D.C., and we're, we're just about finished uh, writing our, our initiative measure here. And, of course, money, housing, uh, loans, everything that you're talking about is inside of our, uh, of our uh, reparations and restitution initiative here in D.C. I'd like to know how can I contact you and, and look at your, your model, either from a, a tiger uh, perspective, uh, or either from a, a uh, slow and sure perspective here. Uh, I'll take your answer off the phone. Thank you, John. Okay. John, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, just let me get to the, the specific answer. Uh, best way to contact us here is to go on to the website, capitalimpactpartners.org, where you can also email me, T Simonet. S I M O N E T T E at capitalimpact.org. But it's John raises, I think, uh, a question with respect to reparations, which really is a social and economic justice issue. I just want to point out that CDFIs have been in the, the business of financial services, but clearly with an underlying social justice theme since inception. Uh, social and economic justice have been a cornerstone 
bedrock value for this industry. But I think even this industry is pushing itself with respect to impact. The more that we see, you know, decades of public policy and investments in low-income communities, we still are realizing that too often the people that live in those communities never quite get the benefit of the appreciation and property value or the growth in businesses. And frankly, these are mostly people of color. We too long have ignored the reality, for example, that a few subsidies or Section 8 vouchers help a very small group of people, while the majority of low-income people continue to live in poverty for generations. So CFI industry obviously is, uh, is not focused on the same objective with respect to reparations, but we clearly are focused on the issue of social ju justice and the under kind of the uh, acknowledgement that we are dealing with the intractable problems of poverty that have plagued generations. And this industry, I think, along with other partners, are really looking at ways in which we can have impact and not just on a few people, but uh, the people that live in those communities and that ultimately want to have better housing, better health care, more opportunities for themselves and their families. Thank you, uh, Terry. Thank you. You you handled that extremely well. I I appreciate being African American and having lived the life in America for sixty eight years and seeing the the results of slavery and Jim Crow. It's it's very difficult. And one of the reasons I like co ops is that's just the only thing that I have seen. The only mechanism that I have seen is people, the everyday people, can get in and start a business or get into a co-op and therefore start building both social and uh, economic wealth, financial wealth. Don't necessarily need a college degree. You just have to have the willing to work and the willing to learn and go through that. So this reparations, the making of amends for a wrong one has done by paying money to or otherwise helping those who have been wronged, I had just don't believe, and I've never believed in the 40 acres in a mew, I don't believe that people would come up and uh, maybe there's a way we could get enough political power to get the government to, to do something with reparations. But I would like to see us with, again, with co-ops to self-help is, is to come together and then create businesses with organizations like uh, NCB capital impact that helps with the funding side of it. Cause that's always been an issue is how to get enough money so that you can grow a business so that we can pull ourselves up. And that's, that's why one of the reasons I like this program and have this program and one of the reasons I like cooperatives is because it gives us an avenue to get out of poverty it, with the desire to work, with the desire to get out of poverty. Yeah, amen to that, Vernon, amen. You know, speaking of co-ops, I just, um, I know you, you will appreciate this. I mean, it's interesting because as a form of ownership, um, there's there's no better way to focus a business or an enterprise on a group of stakeholders that, for one reason or another, are, are not getting the good or service that they want. It's too expensive. Uh, the quality is not there. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a great way uh, for a group of people to join together to create something that directly benefits them rather than, for example, investors. But I think that, you know, we, we can't have this conversation without also, also um, not pointing out the fact that, you know, the government policy has not been very friendly to co-ops, particularly sure. low-income co-ops. And I'll give you a great example, and I've said this before, uh, but I think it's a good example. When you look at the Tax Reform Act of 1986 and the creation of the Low-Income Housing Tax Credit Program, where – this country put most of its resources with respect to housing into rental housing and created uh, an approach which really does not lend itself to cooperative ownership. And the reality is that had uh, that policy been different, when you recognize the benefits that housing co-ops bring not only to people that are members, but the communities within which they're located, uh, the degree to which these are people that have civic pride and they show it, it really became difficult to do co-ops and particularly low-income co-ops. We still had, uh, you know, the FHA program in 213. Even that was difficult because most HUD offices 
you know, we're processing rental housing. So for, since 1986, when it comes to doing housing co-ops in this country, it's been difficult, and uh, there are certainly niches like New York where you can do them. There are certainly niches like manufactured housing uh, where we do them. But I think all of us in the national cooperative sector are looking for ways to have government be more responsive and recognize the tremendous value and track records of co-ops in this country. When I've done my research, Terry, and that's um, my research has been based on the research that NCB has done and Capital Impact has done, and that's the studies of looking at the HUD-funded apartment buildings and HUD-funded low-income uh, cooperatives, and the low-income cooperatives beat the apartment buildings in everything that you can think of, every aspect of housing and living and community, the low-income cooperative uh, outperformed. The rents were lower. Um, the delinquencies were less. People had better pride in their community that you've already talked about. Crime was down. People took better care of their homes. So everything was better, and it's better for the government because if it did have Section 8, a, a two-bedroom in Atlanta was running for $500, where the apartment down the street was seven to $900. If they had Section 8, they would be paying less money. So it's better all the way around. And, and the, the, for, the foreclosure rates, I mean, they've been 40 and 50 That's what years. I was say, the insurance funds, when you look at the insurance funds that were set up uh, on these foreclosures, I mean, co-ops, it was I, uh, someone like Terry Lewis would know the uh, – the statistics, but uh, dramatically different than both investor-owned endorsements, FHA endorsements, and also nonprofit FHA endorsements. Just, so, yeah. They didn't go under, so that insurance wasn't used. <laughs> so, exactly, so, exactly. So, but why aren't there more? And my, my answer to it is because the apartment buildings are owned by wealthy people, and the politicians are more being bought by wealthy people, and therefore the wealthy people make laws that benefit wealthy people, not everyday people. We got to take another break, Terry. We'll come okay. back. Okay, very good. We'll, we'll come right back. Please don't touch the dial. If you want to call in, you can call in at one eight hundred four five zero seven eight seven six. We really like the work that John is doing. Hope he's successful. But if he's not, or if he is, we can still create our own businesses. We're coming together, working cooperatively. We'll be right back. Don't touch the dial. Fourteen fifty. W-O-L. Information is power. We have Terry Seminat uh, on the line with us today, giving us the great information. Terry, we're going to have to have you back on because we only have one more segment. I have more questions. <laughs> Love to do it, Brian. Okay. You know, we, we've talked about education as one of your pillars that you work on, housing. We talked about Aging, the two areas we haven't talked that much about is about health care and economic development. So can you tell us a little flavor of what you do in those two areas, what Capital Impact does? So um, most of the, uh, the health care work that we have done has been to finance federally qualified health centers or clinics, and it's um, – you know, it's part of the safety net of services that uh, that are provided in this country uh, for uninsured and underinsured Americans. And we've done about $750 million in financing for clinics, 500 clinics. Um, let me put it to you this way. Of the number of Americans that go to clinics in this country, we've financed clinics that serve about 10% of that population. Okay. For the number of Californians that go to community health care clinics, we've financed clinics that serve about half the population. And just to, to put a point on this, you know, these are organizations that are on the front line that are out there providing primary care that do it in modern, well-equipped facilities, culturally appropriate facilities, and are just doing tremendous work. So that is substantially the work that we've done there. And in economic development, you know, I would say for years that we have in, been involved in financing transactions around the country uh, that are intended to reinforce, to strengthen the development of local communities. But it really was not until 
we started doing really concentrated work in the city of Detroit that you could really look at what we're doing along with others there and see that there's a pretty clear, compelling, relatively successful strategy there, and you begin to see the impact of our work. We've been working in Detroit since 2006 when we started actually doing charter school financing. And then we joined something called the Living Cities Integration Initiative. And this was an initiative that involved five cities around the country that were going to be involved in, uh, in, in a development program. And since we got involved there, we've done about $100 million dollars of transactions and been responsible for about a third of all new housing in greater Detroit since 2010. And uh, Vernon, this is another one of those situations where, I mean, there's no question that uh, Detroit obviously has had its issues um, and uh, gone through major economic and demographic decline, went from a million eight people in 1950 to 700,000 people in 2013. You've heard all the stories about the number of vacants, the number of fires, the number of vacant lots. Well, this city is coming back and is the result of the work of people there that are remaking that city. And uh, I think, you know, there are lots of players there. We've been lucky enough to join there. And I think uh, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting to see the results of that work because I think the, the lessons will be there for all of us uh, to begin to implement in other cities around the country. What's so interesting, Terry, is that um, in 1966, in January of 66, I went to Detroit. I didn't have enough money to go to college. I went in one semester at Kentucky State. Didn't have enough money, so I went to Detroit and worked at Ford in their in their assembly no, line. You didn't really. And from that view, nowhere is Detroit a low income community. It is bustling, it's thriving, it's wonderful. And some of the people, older people on the line, I was eighteen, nineteen years old, and the older guys would they're the ones that helped me go back to college. One is I knew did not I knew that I didn't want to work that life the rest of my life on that assembly line. But the older guys talked to me, and they would take me to their homes. And these homes were absolutely beautiful. Uh, and you go, my brother came up uh, and worked that year. And after he left Kentucky State, he moved there with his wife, and they raised their children there. So I'd go back. But I hadn't been back for 10 or 15 years. And I go back, and I look at those neighborhoods that you would die for in 1966, and they're all boarded up. Well, listen to this, listen to this, Vernon. The average price of homes sold in Detroit in 2012 was $7,500. January 2013, 47, and house, 47 houses in Detroit were listed for $500 or less. So, and, and, and you're right. I mean, you look at some of these houses and you, 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 would, you, you would die to have one of those houses. But when you, you look at what happened to the automobile industry, and I guess as a result of global competition, that obviously changed, and then much of the production went outside of Detroit. Uh, you had a city with some real issues, uh, among them filing for the largest municipal bankruptcy case in U.S. history, which, by the way, they successfully uh, exited December last year. So big issues here, but this, this city is coming back, and I think you have to – there are I – mean, we go back to public entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. There are community organizations on the ground that have been – that have been working at this for uh, 15 or 20 years. And again, we were brought in actually as a, as a national CDFI because the city was looking to increase its capacity to be able to put an organization in the ground, but essentially would be able to help absorb the capital that was necessary to support the development of that city. And by absorption, I don't mean giving it away, I mean lending it and getting it back. Okay. And, you know, I have to say that the money that we have lent there, they're all um, good loans. And I also uh, just have to give kudos to all the people that are involved in what's called the, the, uh, the Woodward Carter Initiative, which is the work that's being done in Midtown and the adjacent North End neighborhood in Detroit. And one of the things I didn't mention that we'll have to talk about at some time is that there are three world-class institutions 
that are anchors in that community that really are the stability and the strength that we've been able to build around and gain momentum, gain momentum from. That's Wayne State University, the Henry Ford Health System, the Detroit Medical Center, and then uh, Midtown Detroit, which is the local CDC in Sumozi, who's just done incredible work, is one of our partners. And again, we're just we're just glad that we were invited in to do that work. Everything you do is exciting, but I want to go up to what you say is underneath all of this that that holds it up. And you say policy change, uh, capacity building, and then capital. Uh, and that's with the AL. That's money, capital. Um, so what kinds of things did you have to do in Detroit to get policy changes so that this could go government making laws and initiatives to help this whole process to work or not only in Detroit, but anywhere? What do you what what, what are the kinds of things? And you could also say that the laws are not favorable for housing, low income housing. What must we do here to to get low income Cooperatives. Yeah, so um, Detroit is obviously a kind of a different situation when it comes to policy because, you know, we've read the stories about the, um, you know, the issues with that city. And obviously, I mentioned the Living Cities Integration Initiative. One of its key tenets was to be able to pull together all the sectors that needed to fire together to actually make changes, and that includes the city. And that obviously has taken some work, but uh, I think there too we see uh, we see progress. So the reality is that policy uh, creates the context for us to do our work. Right? It either uh, the context it either gives us uh, either gives us handholds or it puts challenges in front of us. So um, everything that we do, uh, from affordable housing to healthcare to education, has a policy uh, context, and I would say that. One of the characteristics of this organization and our strategy over the years is to mount a, a fairly balanced strategy, which combines policy change with capacity building and capital. So on the policy side, whether it's state, local, federal government, there are things that we're identifying that we know need to change. We're finding partners to work with to change them. And for example, all the work that we have done in skilled, with skilled nursing facilities and greenhouses required major policy changes both uh, at the federal level and the state level. In terms of, of capacity building, this is all about providing the resources for our external stakeholders to do what it is that they need to do. And oftentimes that involves technical assistance from us or other organizations like us. And I would say there is a growing area in the CDFI industry where we are looking hard at all of our practices uh, and looking for ways to increase the capacity of CDFIs to do the work. I think there are about a thousand CDFIs in this country. Mm -hmm. Most of them are very small. We need a more robust CDFI industry with more resources and more organizations on the ground. And then it's to that third leg, it's assembling and delivering capital. The reality is that the capital markets and the associated products have not been tailor-made to be delivered to these sectors. <laughs> and so the work that we've done there, I think, is really important as well. Oh, you were being very nice there. Thank you. <laughs> That's cool. I haven't been tailoring it. I got it. Okay. Now, <laughs> change it a little bit because we only have another minute or so. Do you like what you do? I'm, I'm a lucky man, Vernon. I love what I do. I love what I do for, let me just break it down to two reasons. The first is, uh, I don't know about you, but the thing that gets me going every day and coming to work are the people that I work with. I can't tell you that there's not a better, more engaged group of people that I know of uh, to work with. They're all committed to what we do, and I would call them best practice in the way that they do their job, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, I've, been, I've had the opportunity growing up in a family that believed in social justice. I've had the opportunity to live my life, including my professional life, and do things every day that at the end of the day, I know that what I have done, uh, it may be only incrementally, but advances the cause of social justice. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for coming on and sharing it with us. We have to go, and I hope everybody out there that's listening can get that in their life, that basically helping somebody else. And we'll see Thank you, you next Thursday. And I, I want you on again because we didn't even get a chance to talk about what a CDFI is. We'll, well, we have a lot more things. A, next time you catch me in a corner in the room and get me on the show, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you next Thursday. And have a great week. And please work cooperatively.
1450 WOL.